Hi guys, we're going to look at patient safety and patient education. So during Concepts of Care 1, we learned lots and lots of skills, lots of tasks, right? Um, we're actually going to probably delegate some of what we learned. And then those of us as the nurses are going to supervise to make sure that what we delegate gets completed and gets completed in a timely fashion. So when is it appropriate to delegate and what should you delegate? So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Why can't we do all the tasks ourselves? We simply don't have the time. As a nurse, our job is revolved around managing our patient's cares, and that's very time consuming. And a lot of times we just don't have the time to manage all of those cares on all of our patients and do all of those tasks. So many of the skills that we're going to delegate might go to our nursing assistants, our LPNs, our UAP, our unlicensed assistive personnel. That way we can get our job completed. So let's talk about what we can delegate. This list talks about what we can delegate. We may not be able to delegate these every time. We really have to determine if the task can be delegated by asking ourselves a few questions. So let's here. So things that we just need to consider before we delegate a task. The first thing is to think about is the predictability of the outcome. So for example, blood pressure, we can typically delegate that all of the time. Times when it would not be appropriate would be if our patient is coding, right? Uh, we probably need to do that ourselves. If our patient has um, other signs and symptoms related to the blood pressure, probably not a great time to delegate it because we need to be doing those assessment pieces. What is the potential for harm? If our patient is, uh, or if we're walking with the patient, um, what if the patient just had surgery or they have severe orthostatic blood pressure? That might be a high potential for fall. So is there a potential for harm? And we wouldn't want to delegate that task. What is the complexity of care? How difficult is the care? Does our patient have a stage four pressure ulcer and they're incontinent of stool? Um, then that stool might be up in there. Um, that wound needs to be irrigated. It needs to be packed. Creams need to be applied. So bathing may not be a delegat delegatable task at that point, um, right? We may need to do that bathing ourselves so that we can take care of that wound. Problem solving and innovation. If the task is complicated, the nurse needs to be there. Critical thinking, problem solving is intentionally taught in nursing school, but that is not taught in nursing assistant school. What is the level of interaction? We want to make sure the nurse is available for any psychological or psychosocial support or education. Education can never be delegated. Based on these considerations, Here's what you need to ask yourself, right? We've considered all of these things. Now let's ask ourselves: is this the right circumstance? Is this the right task? Is this the right person to be doing the task? Did I give enough information and give the right direction? And do I have the right supervision? So making sure we ask those questions, take in our considerations before we delegate. So let's look at this list again and decide which ones I can delegate and which ones I cannot. And who are we going to delegate these tasks to? So if we look at ongoing assessment, can I delegate an assessment to a nursing uh, assistant? Absolutely not. Assessments are not in their scope of practice. Can I delegate an ongoing assessment to an LPN or an LVN? Absolutely they can do that ongoing assessment. Remember, this is an ongoing assessment, which is okay. They cannot do an admission assessment or a discharge assessment because those assessments require a higher level of critical thinking. What about grooming? Who can groom? UAPs can definitely do some grooming, so we could delegate that task. Vital signs, who can do those? The UAP can definitely do those the LPN can definitely do those. More than likely, we're going to give it to that UAP. But we also need to remember that we're going to um, follow up on those vital sites. 
What about NG tube feedings? Uh, let's say this is just a routine feeding or we're setting up the pump. The LPN is okay to do this. The UAP is not in their scope of practice. They could potentially pause the feed and turn the patient and then turn it back on, but they cannot set up the pump. They cannot set up the tube feeding. They can't start it. They can't bolus it. That's not in their scope of practice. Patient education. So we're providing patient education. That has to be the nurse. An LPN can reinforce the education that's been provided, but they can't be the first person to educate. As far as ambulating, that task can be done by the UAP or the LPN. If we think we're gonna have an unpredictable circumstance, then the nurse needs to do that ambulation. And we talked about maybe that post-surgical patient, if they have orthostatic blood pressures, um, right? then that would probably be a nurse needing to ambulate that patient. As far as medication administration, the UAP cannot do meds. The LPN can do these meds. They can't do narcotics or IV meds. Now, they may have some certifications that allow that, um, but we can't delegate narcotics or IV meds to our LPNs. They can do those basic medications um, at the bedside. Uh, what about feeding a patient, that last one? If this is a patient as a routine, we're okay to delegate that to the UAP. Again, if it's unpredictable uh, circumstance, then the nurse needs to take responsibility of that. Remember, transfer of nurse's responsibility for task performance to another nursing staff member. So we're delegating something that we're um, to our nursing uh, assistant, UAP, LPN, we still, as nurses, have to retain that accountability for the outcome. Can accountability be delegated? No, they can, it cannot. The nurse is ultimately responsible for any delegated tasks. Let's look at the safety of the patient in the hospital. We will think about developmental stages. We will look at individual risk factors um, and risks in that healthcare setting. Safety looks different for everyone here. So making sure that we're looking at those, what influences our safety? What are some of those individual risk factors? So quality and safety education for nurses, reasons why it, it's so important. Um, this is an ongoing process and this is why critical thinking is important. It may be safe for one person, but not safe for another person. So we have to think about our patients, their statuses, their comorbidity, their families, and take all of that into consideration when we're determining the safety for our patients. Our standards and rules come from our governing bodies, ANA, um, American Nurses Association, and Joint Commission develop those standards to keep our patients safe. So you'll see Joint Commission coming around um, pretty frequently in the hospitals, I say frequently, every few years, um, right? They're just trying to make sure our standards are up so that our patients are safe. We use the nursing process to develop our plan to help promote that safety. Future nurses have to be knowledgeable in their skills and attitude to promote safety. We are always improving. That is why we report our errors so we can make it safer for our future. Um, and then you've also talked about QSIN um, in one of your classes, right? It minimizes that risk of harm to patients um, by providing um, system effectiveness and individual performance. So why do we care? We want to keep our patients safe because it reduces injuries. Patients come to the hospital to try to get better, right? Not to become unsafe. By keeping them safe, we can decrease their length of stay. We can maintain or improve their functional status, and it makes that patient more self-efficacy, makes them aware of self and well-being. That is why we care about safety in our healthcare settings. So a safe environment starts with the basics. Um, we meet their physical and psychosocial needs. We have to remember that safe needs applies to everyone in the hospital. The patients don't just stay in their rooms, right? We need to make sure they are safe in the hallways, they're safe in the elevator, they, if they go to x-ray, 
right? They're safe in um, as they're maneuvering down the hallway through the doors. If they go to the bathroom, they need to be safe. We need to remember ourselves as well. Protecting ourselves is just as important. A safe environment is one that does not transmit infection. Always risks at that hospital. We talked about those HIAs back in Concepts 1. So how can I reduce the risk of spreading that? Um, hand sanitation, decrease in pollution, wearing all of our PPE, right? We just want to keep our environment safe for our patients and for ourselves. So here are the ones that we need to talk about. The big safety issues with patients in the hospitals. Um, the first one we're going to talk about are falls. So we know that falls are important and the best thing we can do to prevent falls is to do an assessment of them. We do a fall risk assessment. It's very much like that Braden scale. We do this fall assessment with every patient to determine the risk. We ask each of the questions on the assessment and see how risky a fall is for our patient. If the assessment gets done and they have a four or greater, then that fall risk elevates and we need to be more careful with that patient. So this is our um, fall risk assessment and you can see there you get points based off um, a yes response. So if you score four or more, then it's considered a high risk for falling. And we would just need to be more mindful when we're delegating those walks in the hall, if they're getting out of bed and going to the bathroom, things like that. So what are we going to do with these patients if their risk of falling is great? Um, if they score a four or higher, we're going to use our nursing process, right? The assessment, we've filled out that tool. We've assessed that they have a greater risk for fall. So based on that tool, we're going to analyze that they do have that risk for falling. The plan is that I'm not going to let my patient fall on my shift. So the patient will not fall during my shift today. And then what are we gonna to do to intervene? How are we gonna prevent the falls? And then we're gonna evaluate, did it work? Was my patient safe or did my patient have a fall? And I need to rethink about my interventions. So think about what you can do as nurses to prevent falls from occurring. So here are the ones that I've written down. We can do, right, we do that assessment on admission and it gives us that risk factor. We're gonna put the call light in front of them so that they can reach it, so that if they do need to get out of bed, they can call us. We need to also make sure we're responding promptly to those call lights. Um, a lot of times nurses are like, oh, just trying to get out of bed. I'll get to them as soon as I can, right? No, if they're trying to get out of bed, they're gonna get out of bed. So make sure we're timely, um, responding to those very timely. Provide adequate lighting. So if they can get out of bed, they have lighting so they can see the floor, they can see the bed rails, they can see the doors, they can see all of that. We wanna educate them on any assistive devices. All right, Mr. Jones, if you need to get up to the bathroom, you have to use your cane or you have to use your walker, and this is why. So lots of education. Maybe we're going to place that higher fall risk patient near that nurse's station so that if they are trying to get out of bed, maybe they're confused and don't realize they're trying to get out of bed, it's a faster walk to get to that room at closer to that nurse's station. We're going to round on them hourly. We're going to walk, walk by them hourly. Maybe we're going to poke our head in and just ask them if they're doing okay. Do they need to get out of bed? Anything like that. Keep that bed in low position. So if they do fall, that's a short fall. Um, provide non-skid footwear. So if they are walking around, they're at least not slipping and sliding on that floor. And we wanna make sure we keep that floor clean, dry, and free of clutter. So making sure there's nice big paths for these patients. So these are some of the same things that we're gonna see on our fall risk assessment. If they're greater than 65, history of falls, impaired vision, altered gait, medication, postural hypotension, slow reaction time, confusion, disorientation, right? We're gonna get points for those and that's just gonna put our patient at higher risk. All right, let's talk about seizures. Definitely a risk for our patients in the hospital setting. We're gonna look at seizure 
precautions as well as patients that are actively seizing. When you witness a seizure, the first thing you're gonna think about is, I want out of here, get me out of Dodge, um, but you can't, right? So what are we gonna do for these patients? We're not gonna leave the patient, we're gonna stay right there with them, and then we need to pay really close attention. Some of the things that we need to pay attention to are is what time did, is it? When did that start? How long is that seizure going? After I check the time, I watch my patient. I look at all of those symptoms and I start taking mental notes. What do their eyes look like? Are there movements in both arms and legs? Are there any abnormal movements in their face? Are they turning blue? I'm making mental notes of everything that's going on. The two main reasons that we're watching our patient is we're assessing them so we can figure out how to diagnose what type of seizure they're having so it can be treated appropriately. We need to make sure our patient is safe. Hypoxia is a big problem when our patients are seizing. During seizure, the brain is consuming all of that oxygen. So if the brain is consuming all of that oxygen, there's no oxygen getting out to the extremities. So if our patient is turning blue, we probably need to get some oxygen on board as soon as possible. They also have this hypersalivation during seizures. Um, so we need, may need to have suctioning at the bedside. We need to make sure that the patient's airway is patent and they are able to breathe while getting oxygenated. We may need to do some medication administration um, to help with that seizure activity, to stop that seizure activity. Be mindful of how those medications are gonna be administered. Probably not gonna be popping pills in their mouth if they're seizing. Um, so you're looking at maybe an IM injection, maybe a rectal suppository of diazepam, um, but we may be doing some administration of some medication. Again, upon arrival into that room, take note of the time, the movements that are occurring. Um, remember that this could be very scary with all of those movements. We never wanna restrain a seizing patient. Um, these are unconscious movements. So it could cause tearing of the ligaments or breaking of the bones if we try to restrain them. Keep the patient safe in their environment um, using pillows near their arms or their heads. Try to explain to the patient what happened and provide comfort, understanding, and a quiet environment for recovery. Continue to monitor those oxygenation levels and their vital signs and then we do want to roll them onto their side to help with any aspiration risk if they are hypersalivating. And then the last thing is documentation and reporting it to the physician. Probably someone is um, paging the physician if this is occurring, um, but documentation, be very descriptive on what occurs in the event. What were the movements like? Were there any injuries noted? What was the duration of the seizure? Do they have that aura? Um, what does their postictal state look like? So seizure precautions, what does this entail? It means different things in different hospitals. So for sure, we're gonna, uh, what will stay the same is oxygenation and suctioning. Um, safe environment, lots of education, especially with our family. We may need to educate our family. If they have a seizure, who do they call? What do they do? Patient education, if they have a seizure, what will they do? Um, nothing in their mouth during the seizure activity. And again, we're not restraining our patient during their seizure. So seclusion and restraints. We talked a little bit about restraints in concepts one. Seclusion as a general rule is not allowed on a med surge floor. When we use seclusion as a punishment, that's really not appropriate. So for example, um, a patient is driving you crazy, you tell them you can't. You tell them they can't leave their room, right? You have to stay in your room because you're driving me crazy. That's seclusion, that's a punishment, that's not appropriate. Restraints should be used occasionally, occasionally meaning very few times. Um, there's a higher risk of death, higher risk of pneumonia, pressure ulcers, DVTs, um, when we use restraints very frequently. Restraints can also be very risky. Um, so they only need to be used as absolutely needed. You want to do anything and everything else before you do those restraints. The least restrictive method um, is the best method. 
So for example, an elderly patient that's wanting to pull out their IV, maybe we're gonna call the family. Maybe we're gonna have a family member sit beside the patient to try to distract them, right? That's the least restrictive method. Then maybe we need to bump it up, right? We're wrapping the IV. Maybe we're distracting and watching TV um, down to the point where we're having to get some one-to-one -one, um, constant observation. If we've attempted everything and they're still trying to pull it out, then we may need to go to the restraints for those non-behavioral um, or for those behavioral actions. Um, so we just need to let the provider know what we've tried. We've tried the least restrictive restraint as possible, but now we need something a little bit higher. So the provider has to order the restraints. The order is only good for 24 hours. Um, so we will re need to reassess them in 24 hours. And do we still need it? Um, we need to tell the patient and the family what's going on, apply those restraints, assess them every two hours as needed, um, make sure that they have the ability to still get up and go to the bathroom. They still need those nutritional and fluid needs. Um, every two hours, you're going to release those restraints, assess the area, um, is it meeting the needs, and then meeting their needs, bathroom, nutrition, fluids, and then reapplying those restraints. Make sure you know the laws and your hospital policies. That's going to be very vital when we're thinking about restraints. All right, let's move into some fire safety. Um, fortunately, hospitals are built well and fires don't spread rapidly. A couple of acronyms that I want you to be familiar with are RACE and PASS. Um, RACE, these are what we do in the event of a fire. So for an example, a patient brings in their hair dryer to the hospital, there becomes an electrical fire, it's a small fire in the bathroom. So we're going to use our RACE mnemonic. We're going to R, rescue. Um, we're going to rescue that patient out of the bathroom. We're going to A, we're going to activate the alarm. C, we're going to confine that fire, so maybe shutting the door. Um, fire doors can be used for protection. And then E, we're going to extinguish it if possible. The other mnemonic is PASS. If we have a fire extinguisher, we need to remember to P, pull the pin. A, aim at the base of the fire. S, we're going to squeeze that um, extinguisher. And then we're going to also sweep it. So just be aware of race and pass when it comes to our fire um, mnemonics. And this shows um, just someone using that fire extinguisher, right? We pull the pin, we um, aim, and then we squeeze and sweep. All right, so let's look, move into some home safety. We're gonna break it down by age because safety looks very different based on the age of our patients. Um, infants are at the highest risk when it comes to safety considerations. Um, the box listed um, states that there are some interventions we can think about to prevent each of these safety concerns. Aspiration is a big one. Um, infants like to put everything in their mouth. They are um, sense explorers, so they use their senses to explore. So making sure we're keeping small objects out of reach. Um, there's nothing in their environment that they can get into. If they're eating, make sure they're taking small bites, they're chewing, checking all the toys for small parts, never feeding um, anything that's too small, things like candies, peanuts, nuts, um, because they may aspirate or choke on that. We never want to leave an infant by themselves if they are feeding with a bottle. Um, we want to make sure we're holding, if they're holding that feeding, that we are there with them. Um, suffocation is another big safety issue. Um, it's a big education, especially for our new moms, right? We love like, all these cute little things. We want to put them all in the crib. Um, that's a suffocation risk. At this point, um, Really, the only thing that's supposed to be in the crib besides that baby is the sheet on the bed. Uh, no stuffed animals, no blankets, no pillows, none of that. It needs to be a tight-fitting sheet in the crib while the baby is asleep. Um, babies also sleep on their backs. We shouldn't encourage co-sleeping um, because they, as they become more mobile, um, it becomes an issue. They start turning. They can suffocate themselves if they're little and they can't hold their head up very well that could suffocate them too. The other thing we have to think about is our water. 
um, pools, toilets, as they start getting more mobile, um, but the smallest amount of water they can drown in. Poisoning, um, remember to just tell the parents that they are more, more mobile as they move into that toddler. They're going to get into cabinets, so maybe making sure they're baby proofing their homes as infants. Falls, they're very top heavy. Their head is usually heavier than their legs, um, so never leave them on a changing table. Um, never leave them in a high location. Cribs should be at the lowest setting. When we're talking about motor vehicle injuries, um, the car seat should be strapped in, back seat facing the rear. As far as burns, lots of different ways. Bottles, we should never microwave our bottles because there's hot spots, it could burn them. Bathtubs, making sure we're using a thermometer to check the water temperature. Electrical outlets, sunburns, all of those would come into play with safety. As far as our school age, um, they are very active. Um, drowning, so we wanted to talk to them about um, swim lessons. Um, as much as we can watch them, it's hard to keep an eye on them all the time. So making sure they are good swimmers um, in the swimming pool. As far as MBAs, car seats go to booster seats. There's lots of rules that follow with that. So just make sure you're educating those families as they move into bigger car seats or booster seats. Firearms are a big one, uh, making sure that we educate our parents about that. Um, you never want to put a loaded firearm in reach. The, um, the shell should be in a separate place than the actual firearm. Making sure it's locked up, no, um, locking it up is the best. Even if you put it up on a high shelf, they'll figure out how to get it. As far as sports, making sure they're wearing the appropriate equipment. Um, and as far as sex education, about fourth grade is when you're going to start seeing that conversation at school. Um, it's about when they can start understanding a little bit more about that sex education. Um, but again, you want to start that conversation. As far as adolescents, these are our risky um, population. Um, motor vehicle is the top of that list, right? They're learning how to drive and they are terrible drivers. Um, so being mindful of that, that they're, they're going to get out on that road, uh, making sure they're te you're teaching them all, all about motor vehicle safety. Um, use of alcohol, um, distracted driving, phones, peers, music, right? Um, again, it all just goes back to that safety. They're going to take those risks and we are aware they're going to take those risks, so make sure you're educating. Um, start talking about tobacco and alcohol, including our vaping. Um, I had a 16 year old that vaped according to him one time, but he had several spots in his lungs. So make sure they understand that tobacco, alcohol, and vaping are no good for them. Body piercings and tattoos, um, they're going to get them. So just make sure they're going to a safe, approved location. They're not trying to do it at home on their own. Um, again, talking about gun violence, locking them up. Sometimes these adolescents will know how to use it correctly. Um, which in all reality makes suicide higher in this group. So making sure they just don't have access to the guns. Um, watching um, internet, social media, sending and collecting information carefully, human trafficking is huge with this age group. So talking about the dangers of the internet. Sunburns, skin cancers, melanoma, um, just making the decision to use that sunscreen, um, avoiding those tanning beds. When we're talking about our adult, um, young adult, middle uh, to middle age, stress um, the lifestyle or living the healthy lifestyle so that as they get older, those health risks are hopefully kept at bay. Um, healthy habits, avoiding again alcohol, drugs, um, watching our domestic violence that can occur. Um, depression, who can they talk to? Some of the dangers again of social networking um, still can be very risky for this population of. Um, patients. When we look at our older adults, um, this is when lots of those risks change. Um, so we're going to do more preventative education, looking at the environment to try to decrease those falls. Um, as far as motor vehicle, their response time is a lot slower. Are they safe to drive? Visually, can they drive? They have some visual changes. Um, so we need to make sure they're getting their eyes checked very regularly. As far as safety in the home, um, making sure there's no risk for fires, use of medications, 
Um, as they get older, they may overdose because they can't remember if they've taken their meds or not. So that's when those pill boxes can come into a really good play. Um, so just education on preventing, um, again, elder abuse is a hot topic too. So um, just being mindful of that. So the purpose of patient education, um, why do we need to provide it other than at discharge when we're sending them home? It's just going to promote that healthy lifestyle, prevent illnesses. Sometimes we forget how important it is to prevent those future illnesses. We focus on what's going on with them right now, but we need to really start educating about prevention of future. So education early in their 20s, 30s, 40s, it's important to teach them those healthy lifestyles so they can prevent future disease processes. It helps with restoration of health, returning back to their normal level if they have an impairment, and just helping them cope with any impairments that may happen. So what is the definition between teaching and learning? Teaching is an interactive process. It's important when we are teaching our patients about their disease process that we don't just want to stand there and talk to them. You wanna make sure it is a conversation that it's being had between you and them and they are understanding what is being said. Learning is more, is more of a purposeful acquisition of knowledge. They're intending to learn what they want to learn. They're engaged in that conversation. So why don't patients ask more questions about their health? I think this is a great question to think about. Um, are they intimidated by the provider and they just don't know what to ask? So a lot of times as nurses, they're going to talk to you and they, that's a good lead in to say, that's a great question for the provider. I think you should really ask that. So we tend to tell people that they have this really scary illness like cancer and, they ask, and then ask them if they have any questions. Well, first of all, they need to absorb the information that they were just given. At that point, they may not know what to ask. So give them the information, give them some time to process it, have them think about questions that they're gonna have, and then make sure you go back and ask, ask for those questions. So what's the role of the nurse in teaching and learning? Um, teaching information that the patient and the family need to make informed decisions regarding their care. Good informed decisions, this means they need to know the good, and the bad, the pros and the cons for their disease process or whatever might be going on. Determine what the patient already knows. Sometimes patients have a great knowledge of their medication regimen and they may not need much education, but they also may have been taking it for 10 plus years and have some misconceptions and don't understand really why they're taking it. So just ask the patient, what do you already know and then you can go from there. And then make sure it's the right time. Is the right time at discharge? No, they're ready to go home. They have someone waiting to pick them up. So oftentimes we're gonna start that education process at admission um, or even day one or two when they're ready to learn. So this is a joint commission um, slide here. There's a little video there um, that I would just encourage you to find and watch. Um, encourage your patients to speak up. Write those questions now down. Um, as nurses, we are not going to know all of the answers, but we may be able to find the answers. Um, make sure they're paying attention. They're advocating for themselves. They're educating themselves about their illnesses. They can ask a trusted family member or friend to be their advocate if they can't advocate for themselves. Um, make sure you know the medicines they're taking and why. So teaching as communication, um, knowing that teaching is a form of communication. You all know the communication process. Remember that being a good communicator is important. Develop those good therapeutic relationships that's going to help us teach them about their medication, their disease processes. So things to think about on that patient side, what is their motivation to learn? Do they want to know this information? And if they don't, maybe we need to look into why. Um, why don't they want to? 
address their desire, what's important to you, and why is this important to you. Make sure you're assessing their ability to learn. Do they have a physical or cognitive disability? Um, making sure you're aware of that. If they can't hear what you're saying, stand there, standing there speaking to them is not going to be beneficial. So make sure you're addressing that. If they have a cognitive issue, such as Alzheimer's or dementia, make sure there's someone else available to hear the information and ensure the patient has the information that they need. And then what is that learning environment on that patient's side? Is this the right situation? Is the patient comfortable? Um, is their pain under control? Is the temperature of the room comfortable? If all of that is right, then they may be able to learn the information that's being given. And that concludes this chapter. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we will chat about it in class. Thanks, guys.